Good afternoon and welcome to our press conference. I'm joined here on stage by President Lagarde and by Vice President de Guindos. We are, as in the past meetings, in a hybrid format. So I would like to ask those who are following us, following us via Webex uh, to turn on their cameras and their microphones should they want to ask questions. And now I would like to turn the floor to President Lagarde. President Lagarde, please. So good afternoon, uh, the Vice President and myself uh, are delighted to welcome you to uh, our press conference. The Governing Council decided today to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 75 basis points. With this third major policy rate increase in a row, we have made substantial progress in withdrawing monetary policy accommodation. We took today's decision and expect to raise interest rates further to ensure the timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term inflation target following our meeting-by-meeting meeting approach. Inflation remains far too high and will stay above our target for an extended period. In September, euro area inflation reached 9.9%. In recent months, soaring energy and food prices, supply bottlenecks, and the post-pandemic recovery in demand have led to a broadening of price pressures and an increase in inflation. Our monetary policy is aimed at reducing support for demand and guarding against the risk of a persistent upward shift in inflation expectations. The Governing Council also decided to change the terms and conditions of the third series of targeted long-term refinancing operations known as Teltro, Teltro 3. During the acute period of the pandemic, this instrument played a key role in countering downside risks to price stability. Today, in view of the unexpected and extraordinary rise in inflation, it needs to be recalibrated to ensure that it is consistent with the broader monetary policy normalization process and to reinforce the transmission of our, monet of our policy rate increases to bank lending conditions. We therefore decided to adjust the interest rates applicable to Teltro 3 from November 23rd, 2022 and to offer banks additional voluntary early repayment dates. Finally, in order to align the remuneration of minimum reserves held by credit institutions with the euro system more closely with market conditions, we decided to set the remuneration of minimum reserve at the ECB deposit facility rate. The decision, set out, uh, the decision that we took today are set out in a press release that is available on our website. The details of the changes to the Teltro 3 terms and conditions are described in a separate press release to be published at 3.45 continental European time. Another technical press release detailing the change to the remuneration of minimum reserves will also be published at the same time. I will now outline in more detail how we see the economy and inflation developing and will then explain our assessment of financial and monetary conditions. Economic activity in the euro area is likely to have slowed significantly in the third quarter of the year and we expect a further weakening in the remainder of this year and the beginning of next year. By reducing people's real income and pushing up costs for firms, high inflation continues to dampen spending and production. Severe disruptions in the supply of gas have worsened the situation further, and both consumer and business confidence have fallen rapidly, which is also weighing on the economy. Demand for services is slowing after a strong performance in previous quarters 
when those sectors most affected by the pandemic-related restrictions reopened, and survey-based indicators for new orders in the manufacturing sector are falling. Moreover, global economic activity is growing more slowly in a context of persistent geopolitical uncertainty, especially owing to Russia's unjustified war against Ukraine and tighter financing conditions. Worsening terms of trade, as the prices paid for imports rise faster than those received for exports, are weighing on incomes in the euro area. The labour market continued to perform well in the third quarter, and the unemployment rate remained at the historically low level of 6.6% in August. While short-term indicators suggest that jobs were still being created in the third quarter, the weakening of the economy could lead to a somewhat higher unemployment in the future. To limit the risk of fueling inflation, fiscal support measures to shield the economy from the impact of high energy prices should be temporary and targeted at the most vulnerable. Policymakers should provide incentives to lower energy consumption and bolster energy supply. At the same time, governments should pursue fiscal policies that show they are committed to gradually bringing down high public debt ratios. Structural policies should be designed to increase the euro area's growth potential and supply capacity and to boost its resilience, thereby contributing to a reduction in medium-term price pressures. The swift implementation of the investment and structural reform plans under the next generation EU programme will make an important contribution to these objectives. Inflation rose to 9.9% in September, reflecting further increases in all components. Energy price inflation at 40.7% remained the main driver of overall inflation, with an increasing contribution from gas and electricity prices. Food price inflation also rose further to 11.8% as high input costs made food production more expensive. Supply bottlenecks are gradually easing, though their lagged impact is still contributing to inflation. The impact of pent-up demand, while weakening, is still driving up prices in the services sector. The depreciation of the euro has added to the buildup of inflationary pressures. Price pressures are evident in more and more sectors, in part owing to the impact of high energy costs feeding through to the whole economy. Measures of underlying inflation have thus remained at elevated levels. Among those measures, inflation excluding energy and food rose further to 4.8% in September. Strong labour markets are likely to support higher wages, as is some catch-up in wages to compensate for higher inflation. Incoming wage data and recent wage agreements indicate that the growth of wages may be picking up. Most measures of longer-term inflation expectations currently stand at around 2%, although further above-market revisions to some indicators warrant continued monitoring. The incoming data confirm that risks to the economic growth outlook are clearly on the downside, especially in the near term. A long-lasting war in Ukraine remains a significant risk. Confidence could deteriorate further and supply-side constraints could worsen again. Energy and food costs could also remain persistently higher than expected. A weakening world economy could be an additional drag on growth in the euro area. The risks to the inflation outlook are primarily on the upside. The major risk in the short term is a further rise in retail energy prices. 
over the medium term, inflation may turn out to be higher than expected. If there are increases in the prices of energy and food commodities and a stronger pass through to consumer prices, a persistent worsening of the production capacity of the euro area economy, a persistent rise in inflation expectations above our target or higher than anticipated wage rises. By contrast, a decline in energy costs and a further weakening of demand would lower price pressures. Bank funding costs are increasing in response to the rise in market interest rates. Borrowing has also become more expensive for firms and households. Bank lending to firms remains robust as they need to finance high production costs and build up inventories. At the same time, demand for loans to finance investment has continued to decline. Lending to households is moderating as credit standards have tightened and demand for loans has, in, has decreased in a context of rising interest rates and low consumer confidence. Our most recent bank lending survey reports that credit standards tightened for all loan categories in the third quarter of the year, as banks are becoming more concerned about the de deteriorating outlook for the economy and the risks faced by their customer in the current environment. Banks expect to continue tightening their credit standards in the fourth quarter. So summing up, today we have raised the three key ECB interest rates by 75 basis points and expect to raise interest rates further to ensure the timely return of inflation to our medium term target. With this third major policy rate increase in a row, we have made substantial progress in withdrawing monetary policy accommodation. The changes to the terms and conditions of our targeted longer term refinancing operations will also contribute to the ongoing policy normalization process. Our future policy rate decisions will continue to be data dependent and follow a meeting by meeting approach. We stand ready to adjust all of our instruments within our mandate to ensure that inflation returns to our medium-term inflation targets. And we now stand ready to take your questions. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the first question goes to Caroline Look uh, of Bloomberg News. Caroline, please. Hi, good afternoon, President Lagarde. Um, good afternoon. Could you tell us whether you are comfortable with the expectation that interest rate steps are going to slow after today's decision and peak somewhere around 3% uh, next year. And secondly, since we're now at the lower end of the neutral rate estimates, um, would it be fair to assume that the ECB could be ready to lay out a plan for reducing its balance sheet in, at its next meeting in December? So that's a bag of questions that you put into one question. So. What we have done with the uh, decision taken today is uh, making yet more progress uh, in withdrawing um, the accommodative uh, and uh, support uh, to demand that uh, was made available. So we have made sub substantial progress in withdrawing that. Have we completed the job? Have we finished the normalization of our monetary policy, as we have called it? No. There is still ground to cover. What we have reiterated now is that we were going to decide the future path and pace of our rate increases on the basis of the data that we have, and we will do so meeting by meeting. So we are very much and deliberately turning our back to forward guidance, which is not helpful in the current circumstances given the level of uncertainty that we have pretty much all around. So what we are saying here is, number one, we 
continue and make substantial progress in withdrawing. We will have further rate uh, increases in the future. So the normalization process continues. And at some point in time, we will have, of course, to identify the rate which will deliver the 2% medium-term target that we have. So the destination for us is clear. The exact pace will be determined meeting by meeting. And, you know, to do that, as I said, it will be data dependent and it will be uh, meeting by meeting. But we will look precisely at three key factors just to give you a, a bit of flavor of how we are going to work in the next uh, meetings that we have. First, we will look, of course, at the inflation outlook, uh, which takes into account the evolution of the economy, including the higher likelihood of a recession. So number one, the inflation outlook. This is, this is what we are fighting. It's the inflation. That's the first one. Second is we will also take into account the measures that we have taken so far, because in the last three meetings, including this one, uh, we have hiked by 200 basis points. And third, we will also be attentive to the transmission lag of monetary policy. Uh, and we know, as we do that, that any decision that we make is not going to have an immediate impact on inflation, but will be subject to the time lag that always affects monetary policy decisions. So that, that gives you, a, a, I hope, a bit of the flavor of the thinking and the rational uh, behind those decisions that will be made and those hikes that we will decide uh, in, in, in the near future. I think you had a second question, which had to do with uh, the, uh, the, our balance sheet. So you covered it all in one question. Not all, because there are lots of other interesting and, and decisive uh, matters that we discussed. Well, let us call it the reduction of our um, APP uh, monetary portfolio. This is a matter that we have discussed at our last retreat amongst ourselves governors. And we did not discuss the substantive issues today, deliberately, because we decided on a lot of issues. But what we decided is that we would pursue that discussion and we would decide the key principles of the reduction of our APP monetary portfolio in December. So that gives you a bit of an indication of when those uh, key principles will be discussed, decided, and I will be very pleased uh, to inform you about those principles at our next monetary policy meeting in December. And that has to be, of course, in advance of the decision to implement and to roll out uh, this uh, reduction. So. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question goes to um, Joamana Bersetche of CNBC. Joana, please. Hi, President Lagarde, thank you. Uh, two questions for you. The first is with respect to the neutral rates. You said at the last meeting, and this is a quote, what I can tell you is that the further, uh, the further away we are, the larger the step we are taking, which is why we are front-loading now. Given that the deposit rate is now 1.5 percentage points, and the ECB have previously guided to at 2 percent as being the upper end of the range of neutral. Is it fair to assume that subsequent hikes will be smaller in magnitude than what you delivered today? That's my first question. And then my second question, I know it wasn't discussed in the, in the statement, but it's about the anti-fragmentation tool, TPI. When you're looking at this tool and potentially triggering it, what is more important for the ECB, the spread level of a sovereign bond yield versus Germany or the absolute yield level? Thank you. Thank you very much for your two questions. Um, I think what we decided is clear and straightforward. 
um, it's a significant rate increase, 75 basis point, twice in a row. And we decided to do that in order to pursue the substantial progress that we have to make in order to withdraw uh, monetary policy accommodation. Our sense is that we have already made uh, significant progress. As I said, we are not done yet. There is more ground to cover. And uh, the question of what pace uh, will be, the, uh, or what will be the magnitude of future rates will be determined meeting by meeting and will be data dependent, adopting uh, the uh, review of the three factors that I have referred to earlier, which is roughly and quickly inflation uh, outlook, uh, the measures we've taken so far, and the, uh, the time lag of uh, monetary policy. So I cannot tell you much more than that at this point in time. Uh, I, I stand by my uh, comment, significant progress withdrawing accommodation, more ground to cover, we have uh, acknowledged that more rates uh, are in, in the pipeline, but at which pace, at which, uh, to which level, I cannot tell you. I think we, we had a slight discussion about the, um, how not necessarily helpful uh, this evasive neutral rate uh, is, and we decided to stick to withdrawal, completing that job, and then taking a step to decide uh, whether we need and how much we need to go further. Because it is not by simply normalizing monetary policy that we will identify and reach the interest rates that is necessary in order to uh, deliver the 2% inflation target medium term that we have. Um, your second question about uh, TPI. We did not discuss TPI at all. And uh, we have said, and I have said very clearly, that in order to trigger TPI, we will look at a series of indicators, amongst which the spreads, the yields, but a few other indicators as well. And then we will determine if uh, one country or several countries are or not eligible to TPI on the basis of criteria that I have also described for you in the past, which have to do with debt sustainability, uh, macro framework, as well as uh, fiscal policies. So that stands uh, unchanged. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question goes to Aude Kursulek of BFM Business. Aude, please. Uh, good afternoon, President Lagarde. So, uh, according to the ECB, at what point does fiscal policy, when it provides aid against inflation, run counters to uh, monetary policy? Has the British case made a difference? And second question about a systemic risk that you are monitoring. Have you identified some financial vulnerabilities in our economy and which ones? Thank you. You know, I think in the, in the present um, state of uncertainty, uh, in, with the likelihood of recession uh, looming much more on the horizon and the probability of it uh, having, having increased, everyone has to do their job. Our job is price stability. This is our primary mandate. And we are riveted to that. We are determined. All of us on the Governing Council, we are determined to deliver that price stability which we have defined as the 2% inflation target in the medium term. There is no hesitation on that front. We of course have a dialogue with fiscal authorities and when I sit at the table of the Eurogroup in particular with a colleague who are finance ministers, I explain the point of our monetary policy which is to fight inflation and to bring it down back to the 2% in the medium term. And obviously they take into account uh, their imperatives, but also the purpose of uh, our mandate to reduce inflation. And I think that I must have repeated um, many, many times the famous triple T, which is temporary, targeted and tailored, um, which from our perspective 
will help them address the needs of the most affected by income erosion and also by inflation, but without fueling inflation on a broad basis, because that would be utterly counterproductive in that it would require that we take um, harder monetary policy measures in order to deliver on our mandate. So that, that's the, 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 the nature of the debate that we have. And, uh, you know, we are all uh, attentive to what happens uh, in neighboring country, um, in the euro area as well, and I think that uh, messages speak for themselves. Oh, you. you asked me about systemic risk. You know, it's... Um, Maybe I would turn it over to you, my dear Vice President. <laughs> but I just want to remind you that the, uh, the ESRB, of which I'm the President, has actually called the attention of all supervisors and regulators to the need to really focus on buffers and, and protection against potential risks. But please. Well, good afternoon, first of all. Well, in two weeks, we will be releasing our financial stability review. And there, you know, perhaps, you know, the main messages that we are going to include there is first, and there is a deterioration of the financial stability landscape in Europe. This has to do with the outlook, uh, lower growth, higher inflation, uh, financial conditions have been tightening. So we will refer to the, for instance, you know, the situation of, uh, of households, corporates, governments. The situation of the banks is uh, positive. Now uh, banks are much more resilient than they were uh, for instance, in 10 years ago, at the beginning of the financial crisis. But we have some concerns with respect to the, to the non-banks. In the non-banks, taking into consideration uh, the outlook, taking into consideration the situation of inflation, taking take into consideration uh, what is happening now in terms of financial conditions, then, uh, well, uh, we, are, we, we have to be very vigilant huh? because uh, we know perfectly that perhaps, you know, in a remote corner, of the financial system, we can have, uh, you know, a situation that could become difficult or complicated. And to amplify, you know, the, 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 the financial tightening that we have seen over the last uh, months. Thank you, Vice President, President. And the next question now turning to uh, WebEx, I would like to give to Balaj Korani of uh, Reuters. Balaj, over to you, please. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my questions. President Lagarde, could you please unpack for me your statement that you expect to raise rates further? Uh, because from the statement, the word several is missing. But in your reply to Carolyn, you use the word increases in plural. So just to be, to be sure, are we looking at several more increases, more than one? And last time you gave us a number of two to four meetings. Um, how does that number look like as, as it stands now? My second question is regarding Telchos, uh, because I'll be honest with you, uh, having read your statement, it's not any more clear to me what you've done. Uh, the intention is clear, you want banks to repay early, clear, fine, um, but how? What, what are the numbers going to look like? I know a statement's coming uh, in, a, in a few minutes, but uh, if you could give us some numbers so I kind of understand what's going on. Okay, I'm so pleased that you're honest with me. I want to celebrate that. So, uh, joke about. Um, you asked me about the number of rates. And, uh, you know, in the past, I did communicate our intention uh, to move towards the neutral rate as a first step in the normalization process. Uh, what I'm telling you now is that we have made progress on that normalization path, but that we still have ground to cover, okay? And uh, as we have made those progress, I'm also telling you that the ultimate destination that we want to reach is the rate that will deliver the 2% inflation target in the medium term. And that rate, by the way, uh, is not necessarily the rate at which we will have considered that normalization is completed. It may well have to go beyond that. But what I'm also telling you is that we are going to decide, meeting by meeting, on the basis of data and using the three categories of considerations that I have mentioned. So it might well be 
several meetings. Now, how several is that will be determined meeting by meeting. We know the path, we know the journey, we know the destination, which is not as clear as a figure that you would like to pin down, because we cannot do that. We simply cannot do that. We are not even in October at a meeting when we have a set of data that help us have projections, outlook for growth, outlook for inflation. We will have that in December, and we will take all these elements into account to determine what rate, by how much rate, will be increased. And we will see thereon, on the basis of data, on the basis of possible recession, if it unfolds that way, on the basis of inflation outlook, which will be influenced by that eventual recession, on the basis of what we have done, on the basis of the lag time, time lag, then we will decide if at the following meeting we also have to proceed along those lines. As I've said, the rate will be the one that delivers the 2% medium-term target that we have in order to deliver price stability. Well, on the second point, I'm very sorry that you could not read much into the uh, Teltro um, description that is included in the monetary policy statement. You will have, by the way, plenty of technical details as to how it works. But let me uh, take a, a, a few minutes to explain to you why we made that decision. We made that decision for monetary policy reasons. Now, why is that? Because in the first place, when we modified the terms of Teltro 3 back in the days of the pandemic, we made that decision for monetary policy reasons in order to incentivize banks to go contrary to what they would normally have done, which would have been to restrict lending. We wanted to support lending and therefore encourage them by offering terms that were uh, very attractive. That was the monetary policy background against which we decided to revise the Teltro 3 terms and conditions at the time. Well, in between, we have been utterly surprised by the unprecedented rise in inflation in a very short period of time that called for a change of our monetary policy stance. You've seen that. We've moved from negative territory before July to now uh, the 175 basis point for the DFR. And we've done that because of the change of circumstances. Now, stance is one thing, and it's not enough. We need to have the best possible transmission. And that is the main reason why we are changing the interest rate and I'll come to that in a second so that you fully understand the interest rate that will apply as of November. We're doing that to make sure that there is no obstacle, that there is no deterrent to the transmission of our monetary policy. And that bank will actually transmit the lending rates, which by necessity of our monetary policy stance are higher and have to be higher. That's reason number one. Reason number two, it is also going to reduce the size of the overall Eurosystem balance sheet, which also goes in the same direction as our monetary policy stance. And third, it is also going to increase the pool of collaterals that will be available going forward. And we know that this is a sensitive issue given the scarcity of such collaterals. But the key point is proper transmission of our monetary policy and elimination of obstacles that stand in the way of monetary policy. Now, I'm going to tell you in very simple terms, because you will find a technical annex which is fairly complicated. But in very simple terms, what we are doing is looking out to November 23rd. So it gives time to everyone to adjust and to be prepared. We are raising the special interest rate, which will no longer be the rate that applies up until November 22nd, unchanged. But from November 23rd onwards, it will be the DFR. That's what we are doing. In addition to which, we are opening three additional windows 
during which banks will have the opportunity to pay back if they so wish. That's what we are doing. Thank you, President. And the next question goes to Jan Malin of uh, Handelsplatz. Jan, please. Hello, Madame Lagarde. Hello. Uh, um, I have one question on the forecasts in September. Um, the ECB assumes um, a growth rate of 0.9%. Many economists are much more pessimistic. Um, and a few days before the, the governing council meeting, several factors materialized with concerning gas and so on. Would you say... Uh, that it's fair to say that we are now in the in the um, downside scenario, which was outlined there, uh, and assumes um, um, that the economy uh, will will go down by zero point nine percent recession. And my second question um, is on um, the, uh, the the. Initiatives in several countries, um, several governments have decided to take measures to curb the rise in the energy prices. Um, what's your view on that? Is, uh, do, does it help the ECB to fight inflation? Thank you. Hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, for your question. Um, so you're referring to the September projections uh, that uh, we produced at our last uh, Monetary Policy Governing Council. And we had the baseline scenario, which for 2023 gave us plus 0.9, and the downside scenario, which gave us minus 0.9. And your question really is, are we already in that downside scenario, and are we not facing the likelihood of uh, a recession? in uh, 23. Number one, we will know a lot better at our December next projection exercise when all the data are collected and we can uh, offer you some new projections which will take into account all the developments that take place um, before the cutoff date. Uh, that will be shortly before the governing council meeting. That's point number one. Point number two, if you look at the downside scenario, Many of the assumptions that we have made at the time have not materialized. So in the assumptions, we had a complete shortage of Russian gas. We are still receiving some Russian gas. We had assumed no substitution whatsoever. And we have seen in the last few weeks that thanks to the effort of the Commission, of various member states, uh, there is a phenomenon of uh, substitutions. Um, we had assumed that commodity prices would continue to rise. And what we have seen is commodity prices declining, and for some of those commodities actually declining um, significantly. So we are not in the assumptions of the downside scenario. Is that to say that we are in our baseline? No, because there have been developments that are hallowed with uncertainty, but that are clearly and we say so in the risk assessment in the monetary policy statement, which are clearly to the downside. And uh, we will incorporate those risks uh, if they materialize in our baseline in December, which will give us a chance to have a more accurate uh, picture for both uh, 22, 23, and 24. But you know, when you look at the, uh, all the sort of intermediate indicators that we observe in between two projection exercises, there is a slowdown at play, clearly. There is a slowdown. Uh, on the positive front, we see uh, less supply bottlenecks. We still see very strong labor, and all the numbers uh, uh, accept the intention to hire. Uh, but other than that, uh, positive. We see fiscal support uh, in, in, in discussion at the moment. And I'll come to the end of your question on that front. Uh, but pretty much all other indicators are, 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 are pointing downward. Now, um, you referred to some of the measures that were decided by member states uh, in order to curb energy prices, which is, you will remember, contributing massively to inflation, um, you know, plus 40.7% 40, 40 
from September 22 versus September 21, it's a massive uh, increase and a significant contribution to the inflation that we are that we are facing. I was going to give you an, a Normandy response, which is "pet bank, non pet bank, oui," but that's that's not the appropriate way to address it. It is all going to depend on how it is designed, what kind of transfers are operated, and how transfers, if such transfers take place, are financed. And obviously, as we say in the monetary policy statement, we welcome structural reforms that will target the energy markets in particular. And we hope that these reforms can be led and uh, developed by the European Commission for all European members, if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question goes to Martin Arnold of the Financial Times. Martin, please. Hello, Madame Lagarde. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the comments by several European leaders, including the French president, uh, the Finnish prime minister, and most recently the new Italian prime minister, who've all uh, issued critical warnings about central banks pushing the economy uh, into recession, crushing demand, uh, and, and warning against these moves in order to salvage the credibility of the central bank and to, to, to fight inflation. What do you make of these, these remarks? And secondly, uh, the markets are pricing in a uh, rate, further rate rises up to about 3% in your deposit, deposit rate. Do you think that's reasonable? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your two um, questions. On, on your first one, we have to do what we have to do. A central bank has to focus on its mandate. Our mandate is price stability, and we have to deliver on that using all the tools we have and selecting those that will be most appropriate and most efficient. That's what we're doing today by deciding a rate hike and by um, changing the interest rate of Teltro's going forward. Is that to say that we are oblivious to ris the risk of recession? Obviously not. And obviously we are concerned, particularly about those who have low income and who are more vulnerable to not only the risk of recession, but to the reality of inflation. And when we fight inflation, we think of our mandate, but we think about those people who are suffering most from inflation. And we will continue to doing so. And we believe that in the present set of circumstances, given the instruments and the analysis that we can do, the decision that we make today is the most appropriate in order to restore price stability, which, as you know well, is critically important for not just the stability of prices, but also for the economy to actually prosper and recover. Obviously, recession likelihood, numbers resulting therefrom, will be taken into account in the analysis that we conduct at our next December meeting when we have far more in-depth data and information. On the second question that you ask, um, just as we cannot and will not be fiscal dependent, we will not and cannot be financial market dependent. We take into account financial market expectations. We look at them. This is one of the elements that enter into our considerations. But this is not it. And uh, as I said, we've got to do what we've got to do. Our job is price stability. Markets have to do what they have to do. Thank you, President Lagarde. And uh, the next question goes to Rove Krejic of the Croatian television, st television station Nova TV. Uh, Hove, please. Welcome. Hello, Krejic, Nova TV. Thank you. Um, so, as you probably may have heard, Eurozone is about to expand. Uh, and um, uh, Croatia will be the next member. Uh, and what we have witnessed 
pre in previous terms. Uh, usually countries that introduce euro see mild inflation uh, next after the introduction. Do you see that we'll be seeing a multiplying effect in Croatia given the raging inflation that we're already seeing in the rest of Europe and in Croatia as well? And my second question is, uh, we hear a lot, especially in Croatia, what the introduction of euro means for Croatia, but what does it mean for euro? What's going to be the impact for the eurozone and, and the rest of the monetary union? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And as I said to you and to your colleagues uh, from Croatia, welcome. We're very pleased to have you with us uh, today. And uh, I'm personally delighted that Croatia is joining the club. Uh, it's no longer 19 member states, it's 20 member states. And as of now, as you probably know, already 20 governors at the uh, governing council table because your governor is already already participating as an observer, not participating in the votes actually, but he's, uh, he's there with us. I know because there's a lot of work that has been going on for the last uh, 12 months at least, that a lot of precautions and a lot of measures have been decided by the Croatian authorities, both Ministry of Finance and Central Bank of Croatia, in order to uh, alleviate uh, the risk of um, price increases that happen inadvertently as a result of conversion. So, you know, whether it is by way of uh, required uh, comparator of prices in the previous currency versus euro, or whether it is the special accountability of all the price setters. I think that Croatia has actually learned from what we all have gone through more than 20 years ago, uh, when the euro was introduced uh, in, in a much smaller group of countries. And I really hope that all Croatian economic actors will uh, have to, you know, uh, will feel compelled uh, to, to actually respect those requirements, which I know are embedded currently now in the draft laws that uh, will be implemented. Uh, is it going to be um, multiplied as a result of the fact that there is high inflation and way too high inflation? I certainly hope not, but you know, we, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to see. And I think that it will be the vigilance of the competition and price authorities in Croatia, as well as all of you, to actually make sure that this is, this is not the case. What does it mean to, to welcome Croatia? Well, first of all, I think it's, a, it's, it's always nice when you have a new member and a, an additional member in the family. And, uh, and we are certainly uh, thrilled about that. It's, uh, it's a country that has made tremendous effort uh, to align with the rules and regulations, to comply with the expectations and the requirements that has passed all the tests, both uh, under the review of the Commission and with our own uh, legal assessment. So we, we are, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great uh, development that is taking place in very early 23, and it's, it's, a, it's a vote of confidence uh, for, the, uh, for the euro area, and uh, we hope to help each other and certainly to offer the shield uh, of, uh, of the euro. Thank you, President. And the next question goes to Fabrizio Goria of uh, La Stampa over here. Fabrizio, please. Thank you, President Lagarde, for this opportunity. I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is about um, Giorgia Meloni, the new Italian Prime Minister, that a few days ago used the um, very harsh words uh, in order to talk about the ECB decision. So do you see those words uh, as a signal of a rising uh, malcontent attitude about uh, the ECB path from a founding member of Europe? And the second one is about the profitability of banks. Are you worried about that because of the, le less the, the latest decisions about uh, deposits and, and rates? Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, I don't want to comment political discourses, um, and uh, I, would, I would certainly refrain from, from that. Uh, I will simply say that, or repeat rather, that we, Central Bank, have a mission which is price stability, which is to fight inflation, and what people are most concerned about is inflation, is the cost of living, and I think that with, unfortunately, the time lag that goes with monetary policy, which means that our decisions of today are not going to instantly be reflected in the next weeks or months. So the time lag is, in a way, 
playing against us, but we have to just account for that and know that. But our job is to fight inflation as it stands. Our job is to restore price stability and to bring inflation back to 2%. And to that end, select the right interest rate that will deliver that once we have completed the normalization process. On Teltros, honestly, we have only looked at monetary policy transmission. We don't want anything in between the best possible transmission and our monetary policy stance. We are very keen to see that transmission unimpaired, facilitated, accelerated to the maximum possible extent so that people can benefit from this fight against inflation. And Teltro, as currently calibrated before the decision that we took this morning, was an obstacle, was a deterrent. And it was our duty to complement our stance, to facilitate transmission, to actually make that decision. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question goes to Andra Stumpf uh, of uh, Expansion. Good afternoon, Madame Lagarde. After changing the rules of the TLTRO, do you feel that you will face important litigation risks? Why have you chosen this uh, way against others like the reverse tiering that was uh, on the table? And also, uh, do you think that the collateral scarcity problem will be solved with this? Because it usually worsens at the year's end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, the first test, the first motivation is monetary policy. And then, of course, like, like any decision made by the Governing Council, we have to assess what risks, what side effects uh, come with the decision. So it has to be proportionate. It has to be the most efficient of the potential measures. And from all those accounts and taking in due consideration the risk of litigation, we believe that this is the best monetary policy decision that we can take in order to accelerate the transmission. On the, um, on the collateral question that, that you raised, I'm not suggesting that it is the panacea and that it will fix uh, the entire problem of collateral scarcity. Uh, I think that, you know, was taken into consideration in the decision-making process of the Governing Council, but as a third component. It will so happen that if the banks decide to, um, to repay earlier, um, there will be more collaterals available, and as such, it will, it will facilitate um, addressing the scarcity. But it's, it's, it's not the panacea, and not certainly the main motivations. And you're right that at year-end, things become a bit more tense. We are, we are monitoring that very carefully. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. Uh, turning back to WebEx, um, I would like to give the floor now to Esher Nelson of the New York Times. Esher, please. Hi, good afternoon. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person today. I just wanted to ask two questions. Firstly, on fiscal policy, you've been very clear about the goals that fiscal policy should have in relation to inflation, but has any of the decisions taken by a European government so far encouraged discussion amongst policy members about the impact they might have on monetary policy? And then my second question is on, tel on the changes to the terms of Teltros. Could you just talk a little bit about what you anticipate the real economy economy impact be of these changes in these terms. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, and, and next time, please come. Frankfurt is uh, beautiful and sunny. Uh, we have the benefit of a very warm October, which is, which is helping in many ways, even though it is the, uh, the stigma of something that is far more difficult and, and, and dangerous for us all, talking about climate change here, not uh, regular matters that many of you deal with. Uh, on, on the fiscal policy, first of all, you have to know that the Commission is doing a very thorough job in assessing uh, the design, the impact uh, of the energy measures that are decided by various member states. And in doing so, the Commission takes into account uh, the, 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 what they, I think they take into account two T's, I'm, I'm in favour of three T's, but it doesn't matter. They take into account how temporary those measures are, 
and how targeted they are. Uh, I'm also concerned that they should be tailored at incentivizing uh, the, the saving of energy by those people who are eligible to the measures uh, that are decided. So the Commission does that job and has a, a dialogue with the, uh, the member states when they decide to implement changes. I'll give you an example of a measure which uh, has been adopted by some, uh, some member states, which is to actually provide for a particular price, which is typically lower than market price, which may have some variation up or down, but a particular price, up to an, a certain amount of consumption, which is either determined uh, with reference to the past or with reference to the potential necessary consumption. And anything in excess of that then is invoiced uh, at, at market rates. That's what I would, I would regard as uh, targeted and temporary uh, by nature because it's, it's framed in, in that fashion and, and tailored as well because it gives an incentive to actually stay below the threshold to those people who are eligible. That's just by way of example of what, in our view, uh, can actually work. On Teltro's, let me just repeat that um, what we want is the best possible transmission of our monetary policy. And by removing the very attractive rates that uh, were available for monetary policy considerations of two years ago, we are focusing on the transmission. That will necessarily lead, given that borrowing costs might be higher, to lending costs that will be higher as well. That is inevitable, given the monetary stance that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. Um, this brings us to the end of today's press conference. Thank you very much for joining. Our next regular press conference is scheduled for 15th of December. Until then, all the best and goodbye.